Good morning, Gateway Seminary. It's a pleasure to be back with you again after many, many years. We are Mark and Kara, and we do serve with the IMB in South Asia. And we are both Gateway alumni uh, from the North California campus many years ago. And it's our pleasure to be back with you today. We will try to keep our remarks short, hopefully under two hours. Um, but I do want to start by introducing us to one passage of scripture, which is found in Luke 10, 2. In Luke 10, 2, Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. And this passage continues to be eminently relevant today. Um, we are very, very grateful for Gateway's role in sending us to the nations. Um, we have a steadfast presence there, uh, supported by the prayers of many, many people around the world, including our South Asian brothers and sisters. Um, however, many of the potential harvest fields around us remain empty. Uh, the team assignments surrounding us remain unassigned, and the IMB is ready to receive more laborers. And so it's our continued prayer. As many of our colleagues have set a uh, daily alarm at 10 to a.m. daily, that the Lord would continue to fulfill that promise and send out laborers um, to, to join um, his people around the world. Um, so Gateway, as I said, played a tremendous role in sending us overseas. We learned a lot from the international experience of the Gateway faculty. Um, we're so grateful for the inspiration of former missionaries that we were able to learn from and from the cross-cultural cross laboratory that is California. And we're excited to see that all of those things are still the case. We know that uh, Gateway's ethos is kingdom advancement. The, the ethos here is missions. So we're grateful for that introduction. I do want to say also, how did we get to the field? Um, it's not just Gateway, but sending, is, sending missionaries is a whole church effort. So you may think that we're not in the missions department. That's not our role, but it is. My father, when he shared the gospel with, with me when I was young, was part of sending me over the seas. My Sunday school teachers, when they shared with Bible stories with me when I was young, were part of sending me overseas and discipling me. My worship leader in uh, university, when they taught me to pray for the nations every Wednesday night, was part of sending me to the nations. The pastors who served, um, who we serve alongside in South Asia, uh, who cast the vision for missions, both here in California and in our, in our home state, were part of sending us overseas. So each and every one of you, regardless of your role in ministry, regardless of the topic you teach, all of you are involved in sending to the nations. We had the joy of being part of a Nepali house church in Oakland, California, when we were students at Gateway Seminary, and they were part of sending us overseas. We're both getting emotional <laughs> because it means so much to us. Um, I want to share with you the wonderful things that the Lord is doing in South Asia briefly. <laughs> uh, South Asia is a place of immense darkness. We call it the greatest concentration of lostness on the planet. The Lord is doing incredible things. I'll never forget the first time that I saw mass idol worship in South Asia. We traveled to a holy city on a holy river to share the gospel. When we arrived, we could smell incense. We could hear the clanging of temple bells and droves of people walking out to this holy river to dip themselves in an effort to seek blessings from idols. I saw mothers taking their infants and putting their infants face down in front of stone idols. They cannot hear, they cannot speak, they cannot hear their prayers. And I remember saying, Lord, do you see these people? Do you see this place? Where are you, Lord? And the Holy Spirit said to me, my name will be exalted and I will be worshipped even in this place. I said, yes, Lord, may it be. And the Lord brought to mind at Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted throughout the earth. Thank you, Dr. Arbino, for making us memorize so much Old Testament scripture. Um, <laughs> but I love how the Holy Spirit gives us hope. Even when we're walking in incredibly dark places, he gives us assurance and reminds us that he fulfills his promises. We are good friends with a South Asian pastor and his wife who have planted multiple churches in that city. Our greatest, uh, closest national partners were baptized in that river. 
there are people coming to faith in that place and God's name is being exalted. We've had the privilege to serve in South Asia for 10 years now and have seen things that we are not worthy to see. <laughs> Wonderful things and I thank the Lord for that. We are so glad that there is a long-term unit from Gateway who is serving on our team now. She came out and did her TFE with us and she came at such a special time when we were sharing with a one young woman named Jaya who was experiencing physical violence in her home. Jaya had a vision of Jesus Christ and that long-term um, Gateway student uh, that's with us now was critical in her discipleship. She was a part of her baptism. It was wonderful. And uh, we've always had a, such a great experience having Gateway students out with us. So thank you. We thank the Lord and thank you for allowing us to express our gratitude. Yes, and we've seen uh, tremendous fruit in South Asia. Persecution is rising. The harvest is also rising up and increasing every day. We'd be happy to share more stories, uh, more examples, share some photos of our partners and uh, the work that we've seen. On, on great scales in lunch after the service. So if you're able, please do stick around and join us. We'd be happy to answer more questions and share more with you in detail. Perfectly right. So sorry, there is supposed to be some music there. Maybe we can find it and close out the, the time. And just what is South Asia? Just uh, feel like a video gives a better picture. So as it's rolling, um, there's seven countries in South Asia. That's Pakistan, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and the Maldives. And as was pointed out earlier, it is the highest concentration of lostness on planet Earth. And we do want to tell you guys, Dr. Pate and Corolla and Dr. Goes that have, girls have invited us to be here. We want to tell you thank you very, very much. Not just for opening the doors and letting us be here to be a part of your, your, your work that you're doing here, but thank you for continuing, of course, sending some great people like John and Mark and Kara and the other worker that's now on, on the field with us too. Uh, we want to tell you thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of what you do. Um, we know that the world's greatest issue, the world's greatest problem is lostness. And there's only one solution to that, and that is the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, right? And the way that we see that being worked out amongst the nations right now is by getting missionaries into places where they have a presence where they're able to get the gospel into a language, into a culture, into a village, into a mega city, into an urban context, into families that have oftentimes said absolutely no. But you guys at Gateway have been a part of that process and a part of God's kingdom being made known amongst the nations, especially in South Asia. So as John is going to share with us in a little bit about what the word is teaching us as we go forward. I want to give you just a few things to think through as potential steps and responses as you've heard uh, Mark and Kara talk about their experience where they are and what we'll talk about at lunch today too. I want to just begin to challenge you to think through some simple things. Um, you've probably heard us say this from the International Mission Board before, pray, give, go, and send, right? That's not new, but we say there's a way for every one of us, whether it's individually whether it's a discipleship group we lead, whether it's an academic class that you're leading here, whether it's your own local church, there is a way for each one of us to take a step in praying, each one of us to take a step in giving, each one of us to take a step in going and sending. As you guys know, as we battle, Paul gives us the great illustration that the spiritual war is not in the flesh, it is of the spirit. And we cannot conquer this throughout, without praying through this. With a population of 1.8 billion people, we need prayers. There will be a QR code that's going to show up here. This is a simple step that folks can take. Um, even you in a classroom, even you at your local church, it's a prayer app that comes out every day with a prayer request from the field in South Asia with an unengaged and unreached people group. We'll run through some numbers later um, at lunch, but with over 1,100 unengaged, unreached people groups in South Asia don't worry, you're not going to see the same one for like three years, all right? So we got some time to pray through that. It's not like next week you'll see the same one. 
But how does, that in, how does that integrate into what you're doing in a classroom? How does that integrate into what your church do, is doing in the ethos of who you are? And how are your people that you're discipling, how are your ministry leaders that you're training building in a prayer network for the nations, for the lost of this world, not just South Asia? Obviously, we want to tell you thank you too for giving because without giving, we wouldn't have a missionary presence in a place that has unengaged and unreached people groups. And so we do say unashamedly, we have to be a part of giving through Lottie Moon Christmas offering, through the cooperative program that funds places like Gateway, that funds our other seminaries. So you, we want you to hear us say thank you, but it also takes money to get your teams to the field. And as much as they go and they get to engage in losses, we want to say thank you. We want to ask you guys to consider in your own local church, in your ministry leadership, how does giving play a, play a part? I know that going, um, this is one of those pieces that we always think that might be for somebody else. You ever heard that before? You know, um, I didn't have on my life plan. Again, I don't think I introduced myself. My name is Maverick. I'm one of those um, that, that Dr. Groves missed earlier. Uh, my wife and I did not have serving overseas in our life plan. It was absolutely not where we were headed. We were serving on a local church staff, spent about a decade and a half in the U.S. doing that, taking groups overseas, and then the Lord said, it's, time, it's your time to go. And we were like, wait a minute. We were willing to go short term, but we also said, okay, Lord, if you're calling us to go long term, you've got to make this work. So we want to invite you, our Mark and Kara and John are going to share a little bit over after lunch about how you guys can take some of your go trips. But maybe you've got ministry leaders that are planted in a local church here that want to know how their church can be involved. It's a game changer when a pastor, a ministry leader, a ministry influencer experiences life overseas like Kara talked about earlier. I don't know if you could... I can paint the picture well enough, but it's very different in South Asia when you walk up and you see someone of a Hindu background that worships cattle because their ancestors are embodying that cattle walk over as the cow is taking care of business, so to say, because we're live streaming here, putting hands underneath to catch that urine and then washing her face, believing that there's some type of redemption in that. It's different for me to paint that picture and for you to stand on the ground and see that. So we open the doors and say, come and join us, even if it's for a couple of weeks to see this so that you can disciple, so that you can create missiological perspectives in your local churches and in your classroom. Um, we can do that through ministry leaders. We can do that with folks that are thinking about, a, I want to go spend two, three, four years. Um, so we invite you to do that and be a part. We also ask you to look at how you can become a sender. Mark and Kara reflected on that. There are people in my life that sent me that have sent my wife, Madeline, to be involved in the nations. And so as John gets ready to take us through some of the biblical context of this, and as we prepare to spend a few moments with you at lunch, how will you respond? What will some of your next steps be with what God is challenging each one of us to do, not just in our own lives, but the flock that you're potentially stewarding immediately, whether it's in a classroom setting and a church? Join me in prayers John joins us. Father, we thank you for this day. And uh, God, we are so humbled that you would allow us to be a part of kingdom building because you have redeemed us and brought us from death to life. And so, Father, we ask that as we open your word, God, that you would sharpen our hearts and sharpen our minds, God, and sharpen our presence and our spirits, Lord, that we may serve you uh, better for the sake of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My name is uh, Ryan, and it is really a pleasure to be back here. Uh, my wife, Sarah, and I, we graduated from Golden Gate. Uh, but then they changed the name to Gateway. So I don't know, Mark and Kara were also there when it was Golden Gate. So we're kind of wondering, we were having a discussion, you know, are diplomas still legit? Like, you know, we have this, the, the names changed, so I guess it's just uh, retro. But it's, uh, it's so good to be among some familiar faces and uh, to see the only Christian on campus, right over there, Chris, Dr. Chun. Uh, so, um, you know, Gateway was such a, 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 a joyful experience for us. You know, we, uh, at the North, Northern California campus, we got to know um, many faculty and were mentored by them, but also just uh, having other couples that we were with that were also sent 
to the field at the same time. I think, uh, you know, man, we've probably sent during that time, our, our class probably sent about 10 units uh, different places around the world. And we're just thankful for that, that you instilled that in us. And not only were we sent, but I was visited by at least three or four different faculty throughout my time on the field. And you all have had a part in our work. And so we're so thankful uh, to Gateway and just uh, what your partnership means to us. And so it's good to be back on the campus. And uh, so I want to open up, you know, from the Word of God and uh, just share uh, from 1 Thessalonians, starting in verse 2. Uh, this is a model that, that we see uh, where Paul... Uh, talks about the church in Thessalonica and how they uh, did missions. And it's also, I think, parallels to what we see happening today all across the world. So let's start reading in verse 2. Uh, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he chose you because our gospel came to you not only in power, uh, not only, sorry, not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, and you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of God sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith has gone forth everywhere. So we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned from God or turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would speak to us, Lord. We ask that you would speak to our hearts and show us, Lord God, how we can become more in line with your spirit as we go to the nations, the nations that have come here, but also send people across the world to the nations. So as many of you know, the church in Thessalonica, uh, Paul only spent three Sabbaths there. And this church, this healthy church was birthed in that time. Now, of course, we know there was a lot of other investments and, and Paul probably would have stayed there longer if he had not been run out of town. You know, he sent Timothy and other, uh, other disciples there that, that developed this church. But it's amazing just how the Holy Spirit prepared them and how they were open to the gospel. And then they became such a powerful church that missions was on their heart. And so when Paul was not with them, it says that the word of God sounded forth through them. So he had no need to say anything. They were doing the work that Paul himself was called to do. In some ways, Paul had worked himself out of a job. And I believe this is what we as missionaries want to do. We don't want to be the gospel witness, but our vision in South Asia is that we would see local ownership of the core missionary task for every people in place. So local people owning the gospel, owning that, that great commission responsibility for their own people group. You know, as we go and as we're sent as missionaries, yes, we share the gospel, yes, we're faithful, but I see again and again that our brothers and sisters are so much more fruitful than us. And we come alongside and encourage them and challenge them to do the work of the ministry. So just some points that I see from here. First of all, you know, it talks about the Holy Spirit, how they, they uh, Paul preached the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit, but then they also received the gospel with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so it is so important as we do missions and as we live our lives to pursue the Holy Spirit. If it was not for my relationship with the Lord, for my time in his word, for my abiding, I would not have been able to stay on the field. We've been on the field for 15 years, praise God. But if I had not had those times with the Lord and pursued the Holy Spirit, 
I would not still be on the field because it's very difficult. There are times the enemy, you know, sees you as a target. and He's going to throw all kinds of lies and, and things in, in your mind. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to speak directly to us and say, this is who you are. One of the things I'm, I put a lot of pressure on myself as a, as a missionary. And one of the things that the Lord is reminding me through his Holy Spirit is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So I don't have to perform. I can just let him work through me flow through me, and we have seen God be fruitful through our ministry. So it's so important to have the Spirit, but also to be grounded in the Word. You know, it talks here in, uh, about uh, that, he, that he preached the gospel not only in Word, but in the power of the Spirit. So that, that beautiful marriage, I think, of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is how we do missions. You know, sometimes I, I uh, see people uh, we work with all kinds of different believers, not only Baptists, but we, we train charismatics and others. And sometimes we see people that get so hung up on, you know, being led by the spirit or receiving a word from the Lord or, you know, everyone gets healed and they focus too much on the Holy Spirit and they're, they're trying to promote themselves as look at me, I'm a very spiritual person. And that's not being led by the Holy Spirit. So if we put too much emphasis on there and lose our emphasis on the word of God, then we stray away. We become arrogant and conceited and it becomes about the man of God or the prophet. And so we see this happen on the field. But then if we do not have the Holy Spirit working within us to illuminate the word of God in our lives, to show us, to speak directly to us, then we can become dry spiritually and become legalistic. And so we see both extremes. But if we focus on the word and the spirit, then we grow up in what God wants us to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Sorry, the, the hallelujah comes from the South Asians. When they preach, they always say a hallelujah. Okay, so I'm going to bring that in here. Can't help it. Um, when, when I was uh, very, dis a time when we moved to the Middle East and we served, uh, still working with South Asians, but for four years, um, the Lord brought us there um, because of some health challenges of our family, our daughter. Uh, and the first year, I was very discouraged because I just wasn't seeing fruit. And I'm like, God, why did you bring us here? And I remember one morning in my quiet time, I just, uh, I just opened up the word, put on some music, and suddenly the Lord just came and he met me. And I had not experienced his love in such a powerful way before in my time with him. And he just spoke to me and I just began to weep. And the Lord said, I love you. I don't want you to be frustrated. I want to work through you. I want to change you. I want to build you into a different person. And then from that point on, we began to see God just work through our ministry. Uh, we began to get openings into uh, our people group, into some of the labor camps where, uh, where the South Asians were working. And people began to invite us in there and we were able to start some house groups. Then we also were getting calls from people that were living in South Asia that said, hey, we're interested in coming to, to Dubai. And so we got to facilitate some missionaries being sent from South Asia into to Dubai and saw God just work in powerful ways. So God wants us to be fruitful, but we have to be led by his spirit. So the first point, pursue the Holy Spirit. Second, we persist in gospel witness. In verse 6, it says that they received the word of God with much affliction. Uh, you know, if we read the account of the church in Thessalonica, we see that, uh, uh, that, that Paul was thrown out of that city very quickly. And everywhere he goes, he receives affliction and persecution. So, but we must persist in gospel witness, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the persecution. You know, I uh, have a great story of one of, our, one of your brothers on the field in South Asia. He became a believer uh, through the ministry of some, one of our missionaries and their partners. And he believed in Jesus and he began just, he was on fire for the Lord, sharing the gospel with his whole village, anyone that he knew, he was sharing the gospel with, he, even people he didn't know. He just, he just became that evangelist and the Lord used him. And uh, he had just such joy in his heart. And he had led about a hundred people to the Lord in that village. Well, 
it got wind of it to the religious radicals. And uh, they, one night he was walking to his home uh, in the dark and, and some people came up and they beat him over the head, you know, uh, stoned him and left him for dead. And he ended up giving his life for the gospel witness. And afterwards, the believers, as they were grieving and, and, and just sad about this, that it, that it happened, they said, what do we do? Maybe, maybe now is the time that we need to be a little more careful. Uh, let's just be a little more cautious. And his wife stood up in that meeting and she said, you know, uh, he gave his life for the gospel. And I saw my husband, when he was a believer, he was the most joyful that he's ever been in his life. And he said, how can we take that away from other people? And so the church, in the midst of that, they continued sharing the gospel, and God rose up another evangelist that, that then started planting churches in that village, and, and, and the move of God was not stopped, you know? They thought, wow, they've killed their greatest evangelist, but the Lord still had a plan because the church said, we're going to persist in gospel witness. You know, sometimes in South Asia, you can pray for the church in South Asia because there is great persecution. And sometimes we have to uh, pastor our, our um, national partners through this because they say, look, you know, I, I'm seeing all these videos of people getting beaten. You know, I'm afraid, you know, what, what to do. And, uh, but those that persist and go forth in the face of persecution, we're seeing great fruit. And so the persecution is not stopping the work of God. In fact, it's accelerating the work of God. So praise God. So pray for those who are persecuted. We persist in gospel witness. The next thing that we do um, is that we preach the true gospel. This is something that we have to be on the lookout for always. What gospel are we preaching? What gospel do we hear preached on the field? You know, as you know, around the world, the prosperity gospel is rampant. People that teach Oh, you know, if you, don't, if you prayed and you didn't get healed, then you must not have enough faith, or God wants you to be rich. You know, and, and I've, I've heard people that have, that have said that and, and preached that and taught that, and we've had to sit down and, and correct, and, and we have a, a day-long training that we will bring them through that shows what is the true gospel and contradicts that, uh, that prosperity gospel. But they preach the true gospel. You know, if you look in uh, chapter 2 of Thessalon Thessalonians, he says uh, in verse 3, Our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So two things there. The gospel that they preached was without error. And they did it not to please man, but to please God. So when we preach the true gospel, we preach the words that God taught us. We stick to the word. And so finally, I think the important thing as we're doing any ministry, but especially I think in, in the mission field, because we're cross-cultural workers, the final thing that we need to do is plan for our exit. You know, uh, the greatest thing that we have, I think in our ministry is the legacy that we leave behind. You know, yes, God works through us and God makes us fruitful, but those that we leave behind show the real measure of the work that we have. Uh, you know, just an example of that is the life of Moses. I don't know if you remember when, when Moses struck the rock two times and he was told, I can't go into the promised land. Uh, well, at the same time, God spoke to Moses and said, you're going to commission Joshua and he's going to be the one that leads the people into the promised land. Some people look at that, that uh, passage, you know, where uh, he strikes the rock and says, that was Moses' greatest failure. But, I, but God is gracious because there was a shining moment there that God says, you're going to commission your disciple. The man that saw you walk into the tent and meet with God, he's going to be the one that's going to lead the people in the promised land. So in the same way, I want to see brothers and sisters that are doing the work, that are going forth. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been so privileged to see that our brothers and sisters on the field, uh, they have, they're not only working in our city, but they have sent missionaries out all across India. And there's many, many places that God is working all throughout South Asia. 
And so uh, in some ways, you know, we feel like our work is, has been fulfilled. And now we're asking, where do we need to go next? And I believe that's the apostolic call of a missionary, that we are to go to places, entrust the work to local believers, and then we ask, Lord, where are you calling us next? Where do I need to invest my time now? So we plan for our exit. So the four things, pursue the Holy Spirit, persist in gospel witness, and preach the true gospel, and plan for your exit. And so just like a good Baptist preacher, I had all the points started with a, with a P. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. So good. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, I would ask that you would just pray for us. That, that God would, would work in a mighty way. You know, we're at the point now where we're seeing God just be fruitful, just like Mark and Kara were sh sharing all across South Asia. We're seeing great fruit, and now we're at the place where we're asking, can we, can we begin sending South Asian missionaries across the world, just like the work that happened in China? And so that's an initiative that we're pursuing and we're, those networks that are, have multiple generations of churches, now we're saying, Lord, where are you calling them next? Can they begin to send their own missionaries? So that's one thing that you can pray for us. That, you know, that's a, in a lot of ways, that is uncharted territory for us. We, we haven't, uh, haven't done that and, and a lot of uh, South Asian believers haven't done that themselves and they're trying to wrestle through those things of, you know, finances, how do we be sent to a place like Europe where we can uh, plant churches just the same way that we did in, uh, in South Asia. And so pray for, for that, that we would, that the work would continue to grow. Pray for those who are persecuted around the world. Continue to pray for them, especially in, in, uh, in South Asia and the country that we live. It's, it's a growing concern. And so pray that the church of Christ would be emboldened and Proclaim the gospel more and more. And you can also just pray for our families. You know, uh, sometimes it, it's just a challenge to live overseas, to be sent out. And we face struggles and just attacks from the enemy. So pray that we would remain strong, that we would abide in Christ. And pray that God would send more missionaries out of, out of this this seminary, I believe that uh, even as we're going to gather together for lunch, you know, that, that God may be calling one of you to go and join us. And, uh, you know, just like, uh, I'll give a commercial here, we'll talk more, but uh, just like the, you guys have the Go Grants and those opportunities, Go Trips, Go Trips is what it's called, right? Yeah. Beyond, trips. Beyond Go, Go Trips, whatever it's called. <laughs> you know, you should know that uh, Gateway provides you opportunities to serve overseas free of cost. And so we want to host a team. Mark and Carol want to also provide opportunities to host teams next summer, uh, or even a, a semester option. We've been talking about semester options too. We want you to know that there are those opportunities where you can go and come and see what God is doing. Be a part of how God is moving around the world. And so we want to challenge you in that. So we'll talk about opportunities. So if you, you're someone that God's really working on your heart and you're saying, I'm feeling called, please come. And we want to, to help encourage you in that calling. And let's see, finally, uh, let's see, there was that one slide with the QR code. I just wanted to highlight it. Let's see, can we go back to that? This is a way that you can remain in touch with us. So if you have some interest, to, uh, some interest in South Asia, uh, you're ready to take those next steps, scan that QR code and there will be a form uh, that you can enter your information in. And, uh, and, and we'd love to be in touch with you and talk about some next steps and the way that you can be involved in this work. And we really are seeing, I think, just the, the New Testament church unfold all throughout the world and it's so encouraging. Let me pray for you and I will let you go a little early. So. Lord God, we thank you for Gateway. We thank you, Lord God, just the name, that they are a gateway to the world, a gateway to missions. And Lord God, we just ask that you would send more and more people out of here.
Lord God, that you would raise up pastors that would send people, pastors that would, uh, would have a heart for the nations. And Lord God, that you would just be with the faculty, Lord, as they, as they teach and mentor the students, Lord, and all around the world, Lord God, we want to see your gospel, your kingdom grow. In Jesus' name, amen.